Many years ago, the great British explorer George Mallory, who was to die on Mount Everest, was asked why did he want to climb it. He said because it is there. This is from the JFK speech of September 12, 1962, but a random commentator on the internet says Mallory never answered because it is there. Who is right, the President of the United States or a random internet commentator? The quote first appears in the March 18, 1923 article in the New York Times, which I have used before because Mallory was explaining that one of the reasons he was climbing Mount Everest was to collect summit rocks. But when initially asked why he wanted to climb Mount Everest, Mallory's response to the reporter was quoted as, because it's there. Later, the New York Times would quote it as, because it is there, setting up the big mystery of whether Mallory said it with three words or four. Yet a random internet commentator says the entire quote was made up, and while he does not cite any source for this, with a little work we can see if there is any basis for it. Wikipedia contains a lot of useful information and also a lot of misinformation, but it is a good place to start, and indeed, Wikipedia states, questions have arisen over the authenticity of the quote and whether Mallory actually said it. Some have suggested that it was a paraphrase by a newspaper reporter, but scrutiny of the original Times report leaves this unresolved. The phrase was certainly consistent with the direct quote cited in the report, so it appears not to misrepresent Mallory's attitude. While that section violates so many of Wikipedia's own guidelines that it should not be taken too seriously, it does provide us a place to start. A little research shows the issue shows up in the book The Wildest Dream by Peter and Lenny Gilman. I like The Wildest Dream, and while I will not do a full review of it, I will return to it in future videos. For the because it is their quote, The Wildest Dream sets up a straw man argument, stating some Everest research have argued that George may well not have even made the remark at all, and that it was a creative paraphrase by an imaginative reporter. The Gilmans then proceed to destroy the straw man, pointing out that the quote is entirely consistent with various writings and confirmed quotes of George Mallory. They also mention the statement of a Tristram Pye, which helps clarify the issue. Tristram Pye is the son of David Pye. David Pye was a friend of George Mallory and the author of a biography about Mallory, which came out in 1927. Long after his father passed away, Tristram Pye commented on the issue. When Everest was climbed by Sir Edmund Hillary and Sherpa Tenzing in 1953, interest was revived in the early attempts on the mountain, and Mallory's often quoted reply to the question why climb Everest came up again. My father told me that after his trip to America in 1923, Mallory denied that he had ever said because it is there, or that if he had, he had been impatiently reacting to an exasperating reporter. He never suffered fools gladly. I can certainly relate to exasperation from having to suffer fools, but is an alleged second-hand quote from 75 years after Mallory's death that reliable? That is, David did not mention the issue until 30 years after Mallory allegedly said it, and Tristram's account did not show up until about the year 2000. Nor does the account tell us much other than that Mallory didn't say it, unless he did. The account does not appear in David Pye's biography of George Mallory, although it does contain numerous details about Mallory's trip to America. While Mallory was in New York, he wrote about the process of interacting with reporters. On Wednesday afternoon, I had four pressmen in here. I had already been rehearsed in what I should say, but I don't know that that made much difference. I sent them away happy, and the puffs duly appeared next morning. But that is not all. These first puffs have to be backed up by subsequent paragraphs. And so I had a long talk with a young man who circulates to the press information about this hotel's distinguished visitors. He wanted to get a contrast in value, he said. And to this end, he wished me to say that the great mountaineers of the expedition were all men of scientific eminence or that mental training has more to do with the matter than physique. Can you imagine anything more childish? Mallory goes on to write, but the whole importance of this lecture was to have good press, and when I read the papers at breakfast, there was almost nothing. The New York Times had a large heading and one-third of a column, but the whole thing was turned into anti-prohibition propaganda. However, the Tribune came out with a very good and sympathetic report, and that may do what is wanted. There is no doubt people over here are really impressed by the story. Today, public relations managers handle the making of quotes, but Mallory was clearly involved and was reading what was written. He also rejected ideas he did not agree with. But is there any evidence that the reporter made stuff up? It turns out, yes. In the same article, the reporter tells a story about the 1922 expedition being stranded at a high camp and using electrically heated clothing to stay warm, an item that is never reported in any expedition report and the size of any battery in 1922 that could meaningfully heat clothing would be prohibitive. The reporter also states that hot water would not warm them because it boils at such a low temperature. 
And while water does boil at a lower temperature at altitude, it is plenty warm and a significant source of warmth on the upper mountain. It is extremely unlikely that Mallory said either of these things, and thus it does appear that this reporter was just making stuff up. So where does that leave us? As with everything relating to Mallory and Irvin, people who want definitive proof either way will leave disappointed. However, there is sufficient evidence that he did say it, and just because the reporter invented other facts, it is not sufficient to say he invented that quote in particular. Mallory was well aware of the quote, never made any public attempt during his life to correct it, but this still leaves the mystery of whether Mallory used three words or four. And while this is an entirely meaningless distinction, it does allow me to introduce my favorite passage from George Mallory, also frequently listed as one of his uh, more popular uh, pieces, but entirely eclipsed by the much shorter, because it's there. This is Mallory's account of climbing Mont Blanc, and he is using the third person, so they means his climbing party, and him refers to George Mallory. A breeze cool and bracing seemed to gather force as they plodded up the long slopes, more gentle now as they approached the final goal. He felt the wind about him with its old, strange music. His thoughts became less conscious, less continuous. Rather than thinking or feeling, he was simply listening, listening for distant voices, scarcely articulate. The solemn dome resting on those marvelous buttresses, fine and firm above all, its chasms of ice, its towers and crags, a place where desires point and aspirations end, very, very high and lovely, long-suffering and wise. Experience slowly and wonderfully filtered, at the last a purged remainder. And what is that? What more than the infinite knowledge that it is all worthwhile, all one strives for, how to get the best of it all. One must conquer, achieve, get to the top. One must know the end to be convinced that one can win the end, to know there's no dream that mustn't be dared. Is this the summit crowning the day? How cool and quiet. We're not exultant, but delighted, joyful, somberly astonished. Have we vanquished an enemy? None but ourselves. Have we gained success? That word means nothing here. Have we won a kingdom? No. And yes. We have achieved an ultimate satisfaction, fulfilled a destiny, to struggle and to understand, never this last without the other, such is the law. We've only been obeying an old law then? Ah, uh, but it's the law. And we understand a little more. So ancient, wise, and terrible, and yet kind we see them with steps for children's feet. One of the things I work on is artificial intelligence, and in 2019 I attended NVIDIA's GPU technology conference, and there was a presentation on programming a robot to climb a mountain. It was a virtual robot living in a simulated world, and the problem was that when only given a reward function, the robot would stay down in the pastures around the base of the mountain collecting all the small rewards and would not go to the summit. So a suffering function was introduced to increase the robot's suffering until it reached the summit. Only then did the robot make it to the top. And this made me think of that uh, George Mallory quote, that struggle and understanding are related. Typically, I program robots to have some type of understanding not to climb mountains. Someday, we will create artificial life, and when we do, we will create artificial suffering. The two are the same. Hopefully, when our creations ask us why we went down that path, we have a better answer than because it was there. But what does that have to do with resolving the great mystery of Mount Everest? Did he use three words or four? Well, in the passage, Mallory uses both, it is, and it's. So Everest's greatest mystery remains a mystery 